How do you know when God is doing a big thing? Do you recognize his fingerprints? Welcome to Through the Bible. You know, that's a great question, isn't it? How do you know that you're in the middle of a miracle? You know, it would have been great to ask Paul and Barnabas when they returned from their first missionary journey. And that's where we are in our study in the New Testament book of Acts chapter 14. This first journey had been difficult. They faced tough opposition, resistance, threats of violence. It would have made sense to go home. But they also discovered fresh faith and miracles and a sense that they were doing God's will. You know, we got a lot to learn from Acts 14, don't we? When Paul and Barnabas returned to the church in Antioch, they reported that God had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. A door of faith. You know, that's exactly what we're praying for in the world today, isn't it, Greg? It is, Steve. And and we're so grateful for the, the thousands of people on our world prayer team. And just a, a special encouragement, if you're a member, and as we recently read a letter from a man that said, I serve on the world prayer yeah. team. If you serve on the world prayer team, we see the answers to those prayers in that God opens a door of faith. And and so today we want to segue into kind of a conversation we have every month or so about what's new and through the Bible. And the answer is there's more new things happening than we ever have time to talk about on the air. But in this context, I'd like to talk about our executive director of Through the Bible Canada, Ray Allery, has been saying to me that on average once or twice a week now, other ministries that are not broadcast ministries are contacting us and saying, hey, we hear you have this amazing systematic teaching in this language. Can you get it to us? Yeah. Yeah. I think of the time where we were talking about something and there was a guy who was affiliated with a ministry, I think, in Vegas. Listen, yes, in Las that is Vegas, correct. Yeah. And then it was in Liberia, Liberia. Yeah. And now we're going to be looking at doing ministry in Liberia yep. as a result of this listener. Um, saying, hey, maybe we can work together in some way. Yes, he wanted to help us get some players with Through the Bible, uh, and we uh, Ray was able to help that happen. Uh, Ray also was telling me there's a similar thing happening in Togo, which is also in Western Africa, and a lot of these opportunities are for players, and what we mean by players is everything from a solar-powered, like we often show people the solar Bible bus, but there's simple things like a speaker that you can plug a USB card into, or a small SD card, or even sometimes we might distribute a couple thousand SD cards that people can plug into their phones around yeah. the world. Yeah. And it's just, uh, I just want uh, people to know that thanks to your prayers, God is literally opening doors of faith in all kinds of new places. Yeah, and I know we always focus a lot on the world prayer team, praying for new opportunities, praying for the fruit that's coming in. But I would also, at this time, ask you to pray for the protection of the ministry as well. Yes. Um, yeah. And for our ministry partners. And yeah. we're partnering with more and more people in uh, doing a lot of stuff on the back end that we don't have time to talk about. And and really, some of those people, we just had a, a, a dear, close yeah. ministry partner yeah. whose, whose wife went to be with the Lord after yeah. a long difficult battle with cancer. Um, yep. He's got young kids at home. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, we're at some level exposed to, you know, whether it was Satan, whether it was, you know, the providence of God, how all that plays out, um, we don't really know. But we need your prayers for protection yes. uh, for this ministry, and we would covet those as well. We do. And there's situations like you just referred to. And also there are very real dangers all around the world and our partners and in some very hostile areas of the world. And so, yes, we need you to pray for doors of faith to open, but also for God to protect uh, us and our partners so that his word can get out and he can be glorified. And he has been so faithful for so many years to us. And we are certainly grateful for that. And we need that protection every single day. Yes. Greg, why don't you pray for us as we begin our study? Father, you uh, you heard us. You heard what we said. We need you. We need your protection. We need your sustenance, your providence. Uh, please guard all of the people that are trying to get your word out to the whole world, Lord. And we pray you'd continue to open doors of faith so that we can tell people about the amazing saving grace in Jesus Christ alone. We pray in his name. Amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. My friends, we are following Paul on his first missionary journey with Barnabas. We have just lost John Mark. He turned and ran home to Mama. He'll make good, but thank God, God always gives us a second chance. 
I do not know about you. I'm working on my hundredth and something chance. He's been so good to me down through the years and given me chance after chance. All he wants is for you to come back and he'll let you start over again. And it's wonderful to have a heavenly father and a God such as we have today. But now Barnabas and Paul, they face this impenetrable paganism of Galatia. I personally believe that the Galatian field was the hardest mission field that Paul ever went into. I do not think that any other place was as difficult. You only have to read the epistle to the Galatians to discover that, because that's the harshest epistle Paul wrote. And he wrote it to those who had a spiritual bent in the wrong direction, and they were constantly going off. He visited these churches more than any other. Let me give you just this brief background of the Galatian country that Paul is entering right now. The people for whom the province was named, they were Gauls, a Celtic tribe from the same stock which inhabited France. In the 4th century B.C., they invaded the Roman Empire and they sacked Rome. Later, they crossed into Greece and captured Delphi in 280 B.C. And at the invitation of Decomedes, the first king of Bithynia, they crossed over into Asia Minor to help him in a civil war. They were a warlike people and soon established themselves in Asia Minor. In 189 B.C., they were made subjects to the Roman Empire, and they became a province. Their boundaries varied, and for many years they retained their own customs and language. The churches Paul established here on his first missionary journey were included at one time in the territory of Galatia, and this is the name which Paul would normally give to these churches. Now, these Gallic Celts had much of the same temperament and characteristics of the American people today. Most of us came out of that same stock in Europe and the British Isles. And there's a great similarity. Caesar had this to say of them. He said the infirmity of the Gauls is that they are fickle in their resolves fond of change and not to be trusted. And another writer of that period wrote, they are frank, impetuous, impressible, eminently intelligent, fond of show, but extremely inconstant, the fruit of excessive vanity. And I want to talk about them quite a bit when we get to the epistle to the Galatians, because Paul wrote to them, a very harsh letter, because they deserve that letter. We are a people like that. That's the reason all the cults and isms began in this country. Practically every one of them, its origin is here in this country. We're a fickle people. One day we follow this leader, and the next the other. And it's amazing when you follow these polls that they have today of candidates or of different individuals to see their popularity and you know they can make one statement or a slip of the tongue, and the entire population will shift from them to somebody else. I say something's wrong with us today, with all of us. Well, we're very much like these people. That makes this section very interesting. And friends, that's the reason that Martin Luther used the epistle to the Galatians for the Reformation, because it was written to folk just like we are. And that's the reason the epistle to the Galatians is going to mean a great deal to us when we get to it. We are reading now verse 1 of chapter 14. Came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude of the Jews and also of the Greeks believed. Now, if you have our notes, you know that I have a map in which we have all of Paul's missionary journeys. And you'll notice that when he crossed over from the island of Cyprus, they landed in Perga of Pamphylia, and then they began to move up into this country to Antioch, and Iconium, and Lystra, and Derbe. These are the cities of Galatia. 
and you see them more or less in the heartland of Asia Minor. Now, will you note here, verse 2, but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Long time, therefore, abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony under the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, and part helped with the Jews, and part with the apostles. Now, they brought quite a division in the city. You must remember Paul and Barnabas themselves were Jews. Paul always used the synagogue as the springboard to get to the Gentiles. And this is the very beginning of his ministry. And you see that he's using that method. Verse 5, when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them, they were aware of it and fled under Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lycaonia, and unto the region that lieth round about. And they preach the gospel there. Now, you will notice that they didn't get a very good reception in Iconium. And so they took off for Lystra and Derby. And actually, they had practically no ministry at Iconium at first. Now, they are moving from one place to another. And we are in the city of Lystra now, verse 8. And there sat a certain man at Lystra impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lycaonia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of man. Now, do you notice the reception of Paul and Barnabas and also the reaction to them? Now, first of all, let me say that Paul and Barnabas, they had the gifts of an apostle. They were the sign gifts. They came into these places. They had no New Testament. All they had was a message of the gospel. And as you can see, they had difficulty in getting this message received. And so they were given these gifts. Now, they were needed then. They're not needed today. The church has been established for 1,900 years. The Word of God is in our midst today. And it's what's in the Word of God, and it's not what men do today. If we could only get people to do that. I played golf down in the desert with the man. They had me, I think, play with him purposely. He's a very affable man and a very generous man, very big-hearted man, but he's unsaved. A man who very candidly, very openly told me that he was chasing around. And I attempted to talk with him about the gospel, he knew the facts of the gospel as well as I do. And did you know something else? He believed them. He said, I believe Jesus died. And he said, I believe if I'd trust him, he'd save me. He said, I believe that. Well, I said, why don't you do it? And then he began to mention to me a certain man whose lives, you see, didn't measure up. And I said to him, for goodness sakes, get your eyes off of man. I said, in the first century, they performed miracles and men got their eyes on them. And they had to take them off of them and get them on the book. I said, get your eyes on the Word of God and what God says today. That's the thing that's important. And after all, it's a personal relationship between you and God. And these third parties you're mentioning won't even enter into it when you stand before him someday. The question will be your personal relationship to Jesus Christ as revealed in the Word of God go to the Word of God. Well, I'll be very frank with you. I didn't get very far with him, but I gave him a new approach. He said he'd never heard it that way before, and he said he thought maybe he'd try that. And I said, well, don't look at Christians. They all have feet of clay. 
And I said, that is the real problem. These men are looking now to Paul and Barnabas, and notice what they did. When they healed this man, the man had faith. He trusted Paul and Barnabas. They're pagan heathen people in that area, you see. And Paul said, stand upright on my feet. And he leaped and walked. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lacaonia, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of man. Now, they are really pagans, aren't they? They are pagans. But notice how fickle they are. They call Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius or Mercury because he was the chief speaker. Now, you see, Paul is definitely taking the lead. Here they are. They want to make them gods. They bring garlands to put around their necks, on their heads, and now they're ready to worship them. Fickle? Does that remind you of anybody else? In America, one year, it'll be this baseball player, that football player, this politician, that politician. But next year, they are forgotten in somebody else that's new. And preachers are treated that way also. Now you can preach the Word of God. They say, my, it's wonderful. One day, next day, they want to crucify you. Look what's happened now to Paul and Barnabas. Verse 13, Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands under the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities under the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Now, Paul and Barnabas... They take attention from themselves. They are absolutely not only startled and amazed that these people want to worship them, but they're shocked by it, and they said, we're human beings just like you are. Remember, Peter did that before this man Cornelius. He said when he bowed down before him, these people are pagan. He says, stand up, don't fall down before me. And my friends, we ought not to fall down before any man, a Christian is not to be obsequious or shine the shoes of anybody else or let me change that a little. It's all right to shine the shoes, I guess. But how about licking their shoes? There are some men whose tongues are black with licking the shoes of some man. And unfortunately, there are those in Christian work that are like that today. Oh, how tragic it is. You see, these people are just like we are today. They are that type individuals. Now notice, Paul continues on. He's pointing them to the living God. I'm reading verse 17 now, chapter 14 of Acts. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven, fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. Now, you see, he's presenting them the fact of a living God who is the creator and not one of these heathen, pagan idols or the mythology of the Greeks. Verse 18, and with these sayings, scarce restrained they the people that they had done sacrifice unto them. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he'd been dead. Now, friends, I'm amazed at this. One day they're ready to worship them. The next day they stone Paul to death. Isn't that like our nation today? We Americans are the same way. Follow fads. One time you see them with a hula hoop. And look at the dress today that we have adopted. My, I tell you, we're faddists in this country. Now they stoned Paul, and it says they drew him out of the city supposing he had been dead. What do you think? I'll tell you what I think. I think he was dead. Paul tells of an experience that he had. He said, I knew a man once. Tell us about that over in 2 Corinthians. He says that man, he says, was caught up to heaven, the third heaven. He said, I don't know whether he was in the body or out of the body. I can't tell. God knoweth. 
And who was that man? Well, it was Paul, because he says down verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. Now, I'll talk about that in a rather exhaustive manner when we get to 2 Corinthians. But friends, may I say to you, I believe that this man, Paul, was left dead. I don't think that crowd would have left him half dead. I think they left him dead. They supposed he was dead. And God raised him from the dead. And this man is to experience, as he tells the Galatians, whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. And this is what he had sowed, and this is what he reaped, friends. He had stood at the stoning of Stephen. Well, somebody says he's converted. Yes, but when you sow it, friends, you're going to reap it. I don't care what it is. And so later on, why, the same thing happened to him that happened to Stephen. What you sow, you'll reap. Now, will you notice here that this is miraculous? Because those stones left the man brutally marred, but now he's raised up. And you'll notice how be it as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up, came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. And he wouldn't have departed, friends, if this had been normal. This is miraculous. He's been raised from the dead. Verse 21 and when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch. And may I say to you, this is the gift of an apostle, this type of thing, being raised from the dead, healing this man. Now, I'll get mean letters as I did when I referred to this before. The meanest letter I ever got was from some person who claimed that he had seen someone raised from the dead. Well, I haven't seen him. <laughs> and the interesting thing is that word doesn't get around very well today, that somebody being raised from the dead, because they're not raised from the dead. Now, let's move on here, verse 20. How be it, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up. Now they proceeded to Derby. If you follow in our map, you can see that we're moving through the Galatian country. Now when they had preached the gospel in that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra. Now if you'll notice from the map that we have supplied you that Derby was, shall we say, the pivotal point. It was the end of the line. At Derby, he turns now, he goes back actually to Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, and then makes the return. Now will you notice verse 24? After they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, and these are provinces that are in that area. And when they had preached their word in Perga, they went down to Italia, and Italia's on the seacoast, and they sailed from there, and thence sailed to Antioch, from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfill. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And there they abode long time with the disciples. Now you'll notice that Paul comes back to Antioch with Barnabas, and they give a report of the work, because the church there had sent them out. And they revealed that God now had definitely opened the door of the gospel to Gentiles, because now... You're having churches that are apparently not even partially Israel and Gentile, but 100% Gentile churches. Up to this point, the gospel started out 100% Hebrew, 100% Israel, then partially Gentile, and then more and more now, the gospel is definitely going to the Gentiles. Now a great problem has arisen because the Judaizers, that are insisting now that Gentiles come under the law. That's the reason Paul wrote Galatians, because Judaizers had come into this Galatian country. Now, next time we'll see the great council at Jerusalem, the first council of the church. Friends, this is very important because it made a decision that affects us today. Until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. How could a council that met thousands of years ago affect us today? Well, come back next time and find out. 
Until then, why don't you join me on ttb.org for Dr. McGee's Sunday Sermon, Why Good Men Are Not Saved. Or call 1-800-65-BIBLE if we can help you find a local radio station to listen to. I'm Steve Schwetz, grateful for your company on The Bible Bus. Jesus came home, home to him I home. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Our journey on the Bible bus today is supported by the prayers and gifts of fellow passengers as we travel through the Bible.